Hello and welcome to the Decking Awesome podcast. My name is Owen and I'm joined by the awesome Kira and Brian. Hello. Today we are breaking down our favorite strategy board games. These are games that give the best strategic experience to anyone playing. We are looking for very balanced games that allow for long-term strategies so players can win using their expert skills. So let's dive in. We'll start off with number five. Brian, what's your number five? I'm going to put in Seven Wonders here. And this is a little bit contentious because this is a game that if I'm losing badly, I really don't like. (laughs) But when I'm playing a good game, I really do like. But I largely blame my strategy because I'll pick a strategy and then it'll work or it won't work. What what kind of team team is, is Seven Wonders? So Seven Wonders is a game where you're playing as seven different ancient civilizations, basically battling for, you know, military supremacy, technological advancement, scientific advancements, that kind of thing. It's a card drafting game where you're basically trying to build your society up equally enough to beat other people, but also, you know, do you want to favor one side of things? So you, you know, you're, you're going to have military dominance, but you're going to get crushed civilizationally. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say it, civilizationally. It's like <laughs> it's a word Greek, now. Greeks and Romans kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually don't know what the seven civilizations are. Babylonians, I think, might be in there. Go for the... Egyptians are definitely in there. Yeah, so it's probably the, the civilizations of the seven wonders themselves. With a name like Check that, I'd, I'd expect it would be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it, what, what makes it strategic? So it's the most points wins? Yeah, so it's, it's basically the most points wins, but you can get points different ways. So... Like, obviously, you'll draft your cards, but then you can, depending on how you've decided to focus your efforts, maybe, you know, you've gone very scientific or maybe you've gone towards building a wonder. If you're building a big army, the people either side of you are going to lose as a result. But you can also adapt your strategy because, you know, if you're if you're playing to kind of build up evenly, you've got a good chance of winning, but you're not guaranteed it. But if the person to your left has got an enormous army and you know you're going to have to put in huge effort to keep up with them. You're going to have to adapt your strategy and just go, look, I'm just going to take that loss on military and now I'm going to have to focus on the other areas. They've wasted a lot of their cards building up their military. They're going to beat me no matter what. It doesn't matter if they beat me by one or by 50. They've beaten me. I would say that the the struggle is that you have to keep up with them because if you, they beat you by 50, you you lose like 50 victory points. So I always struggle with that. If I don't go for one area, I think I lose too much in the areas that I didn't invest in. Yeah. Well, uh, hmm. yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's I, definitely a balance there. I've yeah. played a couple of times and the balance with the military is always tricky. When someone has a big, strong military, it seems like they're always out in head. Yeah. But yeah, like, like Brian said, developing into other ones in other kind of combo areas, like in technology, that might get you to win. It is about the balance, but I just don't think you can, there's no one area you can just let slide too much yeah you do have to focus on uh on kind of all the areas you can't just ignore it so you have to be strategic in how you do it and it can't just be like a last ditch effort because there's points scored throughout the game you can't just go oh well i'll just wait and build that up at the end you have to you have to focus on everything throughout the whole game so you have to balance it you have to think the whole way through the game and nearly plan ahead to go, okay, well, if I focus heavy on military this round, that means the next round, my neighbors are going to have to focus on military as well to keep up with me. So that'll make them take those cards and give me a chance maybe to build up my my scientific side or build up my wonder or whatever it may be. It's an incredibly satisfying game as well, once you actually build up your kind of tableau of locations and stuff. Yeah, it's a game that's as I said, you really enjoy it or you really hate it. <laughs> and it's fast. It's fast. Is it around 30 minutes playtime? No, I think it's a bit longer than that. You've got... It depends on how many players. So I think the last time we played a seven player game, it took a lot longer than 30 minutes. Yeah. So I think the, the player count is really, uh, I think, really influential on that. On I that think we minutes. had a few players who were kind of new to Seven Wonders as well. So they were kind of getting the gist of it. But I think, yeah, if you've, if you've got kind of four or five players and everyone's familiar with the game, you'd probably play it pretty quickly, half an hour, 40 minutes, maybe. Uh, is there any problems with Seven Wonders, like analysis paralysis or randomness? Analysis paralysis is an absolute nightmare in this, in this game, especially <laughs> yeah. with card drafting, because you'll be sitting there trying to think what you're going to do. And, you know, you've got 
six or seven cards in your hand and you're trying to decide which is the best one to pick because there's some really good ones that you don't want to pass on to the next person and all the while there's cards backing up behind you as the players to your right have you know they've already picked their cards and you're waiting and you're trying to decide and then like you'll pass them on and then the next player is playing catch up while you're trying to get through them all and it's a game that falls very victim to analysis paralysis like unless you have someone who knows exactly what cards they want and they're lucky enough to get the cards each time but it's it's a game that you, you can have a strategy, but the cards that show up in front of you may force you to alter that strategy. Yeah, yeah, but you can have a long term strategy the whole yeah. way through picking up the cards. That yeah, that is tough. The analysis paralysis of card drafting games. Yeah, it's hard to weigh up the pros and cons. Kira, what's your number five? My number five is side. So this is a kind of Winter Army's attack strategy game. There's I think it can be up to five armies. There's a lot of different mechanics. There's a combat mechanic. There's a resources. And mostly it's about control of a board. So it has kind of those old risk elements in there, but with a lot more options for advancement and achievement. Um, it's a lot of like investing in the right resources and getting the right tiles on the map and c- maintaining control of them and picking your battles. And so the... Very first time we played My Little Side and that was about, you know, hitting people with pies, which is really fun for kids. And then we play, I played Side a few times, but I think that just the, I really enjoyed the investment in, in that. And it was really great during the pandemic because there was a lot, there's a really good quality online version of the game that's really, really fun to play as well. And you get rid of that setup time that you have for the game. So that's always good. And there's different characters and they have slightly different advantages. Like there's kind of just whichever faction you start with, I think, has a different one or you get a card that has a different advantage. I think it's like a little something to do with your your army. So there is each player does have a very small, I would say that that's probably not the most influential starting bonus ever but it, yeah it's really really fun and there's like mechs and who doesn't love mechs <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I absolutely love so very popular game it's got giant robots in some sort of european place <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't what's no it's not the love <laughs> um, it and, feels snowy i don't know where it is but it feels very snowy <laughs> yeah and I, lo- I love the strategic elements of it I especially love the action selection point where you can't pick the actions you picked the previous turn. You can only pick new ones. And so you end up having to try and control this area by like moving and then, you know, uh, harvesting grain. And it's a very weird combination. And then as you advance, you also get access to new, bigger robots. So the advancement feels satisfying. It's Instead of just getting like, oh, you get more grain every turn. No, I now have a giant robot with a <laughs> laser gun. Like, it's so cool. That you're um, using to pick grain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm using um, to protect the people picking the grain. <laughs> it's a cool. It's a very cool concept, and I love the minis and stuff. But yeah, like at about two hours, it's a it's a pretty beefy game. Yes, it's an investment, and I would say that that's probably the reason it, I wouldn't play it too often. But I do get a lot of satisfaction out of playing it when I do play it. Yeah, and a lot of victory points for lots of different strategies. So uh, you obviously have to play it a couple of times to figure out what strategies work, what strategies don't. And the combat system is kind of cool. It doesn't happen as often as you might think with giant robots going through Europe, but you tend not to attack each other a whole lot. There's enough areas. If the, like we play three player, so it's up to five players in sight. Yeah. So it depends on the amount of players. And I, I think, yeah, the, the map can be quite spacious for what it is. And there's other more important things like carrying resources about and getting over rivers that are the real struggles in, in the fight. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when you just get stuck one side of a river and you just can't cross it. It's, it's, it's such a pain. So so I think that, that makes it really interesting. And it's just because it's so expensive to cross the river, it's unaffordable. No, that's not why. <laughs> this is Europe, not Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose Scandinavia is part of Europe. What are the problems with sight? So it it definitely suffers from analysis paralysis. There's a lot going on and sometimes you can be waiting a long time. Like I think when we play online, you can go make a cup of tea sometimes and come back and people are still thinking. I think there is a countdown element. Maybe there's not. Maybe we just enforce the countdown element (laughs) eventually. But there's just a lot going on. So it can be quite hard to remember 
all the ways you can win and all the ways you can get points. So people lose focus on what their mission is and then or get distracted by something and then it takes them a while to get back into it. But a lot of it's open um, and out there and very clear. I know there's some minor missions that are, you know, you you get and you can kind of hide. But you see the gradual build up of who's winning and who's losing and it kind of means you're more likely to attack that player or try and yeah, gain ground on them. So I think it, it, it works quite well, but definitely an analysis process is pretty bad and it can be pretty bad in the game. Yeah, I like I like that a lot. Okay, so uh, my number five is Blood Rage, which is probably a fantastic game that I, I, I love playing. It's got really great minis in it. And as the name suggests, it's a pretty combat heavy game. It's about Vikings fighting and there's all sorts of gods like Loki and and Thor and trying to get into Valhalla by killing people and there's all sorts of like the Kraken and fire giants and all sorts of stuff like that but from a strategy point of view there's not a whole lot of overall strategy from beginning to end but at the start for each round there's a lot of strategy in the choices so it's kind of like seven wonders in that there's a card drafting mechanism at the start but there's not a lot of analysis paralysis because the cards only really affect your current turn. You can bring some cards over to the next turn, but it's kind of rare. And so, you know, at the start, you're trying to pick what cards you want. Do you want more people? Do you want a better combat? Do you want some way of gaining like different areas? So there's lots of different strategies to pick when you have those cards in front of you. And it kind of dictates how you want to get points in the game. Like, for example, there's a guy who, if you lose guys and they go to Valhalla, you get points. Yeah. Just and so, sacrificing wave after wave <laughs> of army. <laughs> yeah, and you don't and you don't know that that's happening until the person plays the card and they're like, oh, this is this person? I shouldn't have been attacking them so heavy. And it makes sense that they're like not attacking back that heavy. You know? Yeah. yeah. They're they're going up against the big enemies. You're like, there's no way they're gonna win that fight. What are they doing? <laughs> but then they've pulled this strategy out of the bag where they're, yeah, they're yeah. getting points for just killing the, their own army. Yeah, the general, I would not follow into battle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for Blood Rage, the individual strategy is very good for, for when you're playing around, things change as they go, but you'll have an idea of what you want to accomplish in your turn and the kind of cards you want to play and when to play them. So it's a lot about reading the opponents, what, what do you think they're going to do and coming up with a strategy to get the most amount of points. I like it because it's per round and so it gets rid of a lot of that analysis paralysis. But at the same time, it does mean that you don't get a lot of the overarching, you know, satisfaction. So your your, your choices you make in round one aren't really going to affect round two or round three. And it does really kind of make you feel like round one and two are pointless when round three comes along. But, you know, it's fun no matter what happens throughout the entire game. What's a player count like in game length? It is about an hour, an hour and a half for a game length. And it's two to four players. Uh, but there is like expansions and stuff to five players. So it's a kind of a short game, a short like strategy game. Yeah, it can get crowded with five players when you have the expansion. It's, it's, you know, it's an area control game where there's only like seven areas. So, you know, you run out of room pretty quickly. But it's a very fun one. It's a very fun and engaging one. But yeah, there's, it can be a little bit too random. It can be a little bit too chaotic. And is that from the decks? It's There's a lot of, there's a lot of deck randomness. There's a lot of combat randomness. You're never really sure if your strategy is going to work out. Kind of like how, like in risk, you're just going to send more people to make sh- to ensure you get the victory. But even then, things can go wrong. So it's a tricky one, but I, I certainly do love it. Yeah. I also think it's a really good game. I definitely enjoy the the miniatures. They're pretty cool, and the different options for winning the game. I think that 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 makes it really really interesting. And a lot of ways you can be creative with the cards you get to combine them to to get you the most points possible. You know, based on controlling areas or dying in battle or winning in battle. <laughs> I think it's important with strategic games is having different options for winning the game. Even if they aren't majorly important, maybe there's only one big thing you have to do. But if there's lots of side objectives, that helps ensure that no one really knows who's going to win. And then you're like, why is that person doing that strategy? Because it might work, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's better than just having one like clear, definitive, this is going to be the winning strategy. Yeah. Because everyone's just going to go for it. it? Who has the most made of wheat? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> so, Brian, what's your number four? 
My number four is a game I'm sure everyone's played, Stone Age. I think uh, you're building up a, a little Stone Age society, you're completing quests, you're growing your population, you're harvesting wheat, you're gather- gathering resources and that. On the front of it, it's just a simple worker placement game, but it's a very fun game and it's very easy to pick up because it's just about building up, building up, building up, you know, and and there's lots of different strategies you can take. Do you want to go very heavy into resources so you're never struggling to feed your people or do you want to just put up a huge population and then, you know, have to commit a couple of people each round to feeding them? Or do you want to just keep a small population, maybe go for task multipliers or do you want to you know try build little huts and get extra bonus points and stuff from there so there's lots of different ways that you can strategize and lots of different routes and options and that that you can take to get points i really like that because you know you're playing a long-term goal for the most part you can keep playing that throughout the whole game you know every now and again someone is going to take the the card you want or the the hut you want or they're going to create an extra person when you were hoping to do it this turn but because the first player spot rotates around it means you can add an extra element of strategy to go okay well people are probably going to go for that and that this round so i probably won't get them so let's focus on something else but next round i'll have a chance at you know getting an extra wheat or i'll have a chance at getting an extra tool which lets me adjust my dice rolls and stuff like that so there is a slight element of randomness to it with the dice but on the whole you can still plan and strategize your whole game out in advance but it's a simple fun quick, easy to pick up game that's, you know, it's very accessible for for a lot of people. And it's one that I feel doesn't really suffer from analysis paralysis like a lot of strategy games would because there's there's lots of options on the board. You know, you're probably thinking of four, five, six, one. So even if one of them gets taken, you're going to go, okay, well, I'll go for that one instead. And so the ones like, you know, tools and wheat and stuff like that that are, you can only have one person on, they're key to get early on but after they're gone you know it's resources or tasks or whatever it may be so that's kind of what you're going to move to focus on after that even if a little bit of your strategy has changed not a lot of it is so you can still have your long-term plan maybe as i said maybe you want to go for you know having a huge collection of of tools that you can use so it doesn't really matter what you roll on the dice you can always just adjust it to whatever you want or maybe you want to focus on wheat production so that there's always enough food there and you can spare sending men out to go hunting for food and that frees them up for resources there's so many options to it and it's not really until you kind of get to end game that you you can start seeing who's winning what strategies have paid off and I, i've seen people win with every different strategy going so for that reason i'm gonna i'm gonna put it up there in my top five <laughs> yeah I, I love stone age uh, i love the team of it and uh, like you know you're creating a tribe and trying to make that tribe the best and so there's like art involved as well as like as you're building up, do you want to build these kind of complicated things that involve gold and silver? Or do you want to just go for like wood and then get some of these kind of cultural artifacts instead, which can cost different amounts depending on what time you buy them at? It's it's a very, a very kind of strategic concept with the kind of fundamental aspect of wheat tools and population increase. And so depending on your player, you can you can see your strategy as it evolves. And I like the limited player interaction. So there's only areas where you care about player interaction and areas where you just can be kind of self-contained. So I don't like it when the whole game is like you can starve somebody out of resources completely or you can starve somebody out of some sort of area. Like, sure, you can you can ensure that unless it's the player's first go, they can't get something, but you can't completely take over the the game just to be mean. You know, there's only a limited amount you can do that. So everyone has at least one go every every five where they can actually always get their pick of, of everything. And I think that that's nice. And then that really you're only minorly inconveniencing people when you're being mean to them. Like if you're getting a hut before they do, like another hut's going to come up. Maybe at the end game, you start to get very, very close. But overall, you can annoy somebody but you can't like push them out of the game so that it's kind of a cruel game and I like that I like that kind of balance yeah the limited amount of spots in like wood and in gold and stuff means that if you want to block someone you got to commit a lot of stuff to it 
way more than is necessary or needed. So that kind of weight means it's just if, if someone's blocking you out of wood, they want wood too. That's yeah. just part of the game. It's not because they're trying to get rid of you. You can't you can't afford to burn a whole turn just to be mean to another player. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think that that's good. And are you, are you worried that Stone Age might be a little bit too random? Because collecting resources, you have to roll dice, like gold and stuff. Um, yeah, like, I mean, there is an element of random to it, but I mean, it would be it should be too straightforward if it was just put one man there, get one piece of gold. That almost takes away from the strategy element because it's just too straightforward. Then it's just a, a maths game. Yeah. But adding in the little dice rolls to collect the resources means that you have to think okay well look I absolutely need three goals to complete this so I could put three guys there and just hope I roll really well but you're going no look I need to I need the gold to complete this this turn so you have to commit more of your men to it than you'd probably like to just to guarantee a better chance at dice rolls and then that is going to impact the rest of your strategy for this round so you're going to have to you know take into account okay well maybe I'll just let my guys go a bit hungry this round or you know maybe I don't need the wood that's for two or three rounds away so I can sacrifice that this turn and you know that's that kind of thing actually I think heightens the strategy because you need to calculate probabilities as well as you know just going oh well I go there I get that yeah I, lo- I love Stone Age because the more I play it the more strategies it comes up with it might, it might feel like you know you play it a couple of times there's like obvious strategies in Stone Age but you can win it in multiple different ways but it, it's, it's, tr- it's a tricky game to kind of figure out from a strategy point of view there's a lot of depth in it mm. so Kira what is your number four so Clank is my number four it's a deck building game in a, a dungeon and there is a dragon. So everyone loves a dragon. Obviously, that has nothing to do with the strategy. <laughs> um, there's really, if you break it down, two core elements. There's the like movement element and the points, gems, stealing element. And you can like fight to get the gems or you can get into the dungeon to get the gems. But I like that there is a very simple core set of mechanics or requirements that you can keep really clear in your head. Then there's just your assessment of the other players. So like Brian always likes to finish games really quickly for some unknown reason because he doesn't necessarily win because of it, but he will always try and steal something and then run out of the dungeon. So you always have to be careful of like the other players that are like that. How long do you have once they get something to spend time. So, you know, if you invest heavily in movement a lot, you lose the attack or the, you know, your power, but you have a lot more control than the other players of getting out of the dungeon. So you feel a lot safer than they do. So it's kind of that balance of how safe do you need to feel and how quick do you need to get out versus how much gold you're going to make because you don't want to get trapped in either. And you've only got three rounds once the first player comes out. So, you know, it's a tight timeline. And I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the the like the strategy of balancing not a whole lot of different things. Something like Stone Age and Sides and the, the uh, Seven Wonders have a lot more elements to balance. But this just has, it's a simpler one and it doesn't usually last that long. It really depends on how... Uh, how fast Brian gets it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I stand by my strategy. <laughs> And you, it does cause you to win sometimes and sometimes it causes you to lose. I'm not sure that you ever think about which which is happening though. <laughs> but I, like, I, I I like the strategy element of it, yeah. Yeah, it's about, it's about 30 to 60 minutes long. Yeah. But pretty sh- uh, straightforward. It obviously depends on how aggressively fast players are. As you move through the dungeon, you have different routes you can take. Some are riskier than others and that's kind of a lot where the balance comes in and if you're trying to get out of the dungeon do you take the risky approach or do you try and go around sometimes you don't have enough time and then that's where the, the kind of sweat starts coming out of you there's a, there's a lot of strategy a lot of different choices you can make as you progress through the dungeon and it's a deck building game so you can create your own deck and make it as powerful as possible and choose it however you want so there's a lot of strategy in that I think like with the deck building games, there is, you know, an element of luck to it that, you know, you might need a lot of movement this turn and you get a lot of attack points or you get a lot of gold or whatever it is. But I I do, I do like it that Clank is one of my favorite games. (laughs) (laughs) Stupid card building games. (laughs) All the same. Clank is one of my favorite games, but like you said, I love the, the the variety of strategy that you can you can go down, you can take your time, you can gather as much as possible. But you know, when you're playing with someone like me who's going to run in and run out, there's the potential that I'm going to force you to lose the game, despite the fact that you have more points because the dragon got you. Yeah, really tricky, really tricky. Is the deck building games are they too random, 
or um, is it your own problem if you create your own deck incorrectly? So I think it is your own problem. I think that that's why two deck builders have made it on my list. I wonder what the second is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Because I just think that like, it's a really interesting way of keeping random in a game because you have a lot of control over your cards and the random is all your own fault. You have to balance those combinations and make sure that there's a scattering. And everyone gets a bad hand sometimes. And like, how are you going to make do? How are you going to do the best you can do with that bad hand? I like that. I, I like to be kept on my toes a little bit, even in a strategic game. So straightforward strategic can get, I can find, can get a bit boring, whereas building my own deck always seems a little bit more random. Yeah, I'm always up for a game of Clank. Awesome, awesome game. All right, so my number four is Gaia Project which is a kind of a remake of the Terra Mystica guys. But this one is set in space, a sprawling, Ooh. epic space adventure. And if you just watched a Dune movie, it's a lot like that. Lots of different <laughs> factions all vying for power. Absolutely incredible game. If you like very depth, lots of different strategies, long play times, like you can go up to over two hours to play this game. Just lots of different cho- choices you can make as you progress through it. This is the hefty kind of strategic game, but it's incredibly balanced, incredibly well balanced. It's not like you can go down the wrong path and be worried. So even in your first game, you can kind of like mess things up a little bit, but um, you'll still have a decent score if you keep plugging away at that strategy. It has like obviously different rounds, give you different points. And so the more you play the game, you can start getting finer and finer strategic kind of choices to make. When do you go for certain buildings and when do you expand and choose different places absolutely incredible now it's it's obviously it's a big thing to take in if this is your first board game ever to play you are not going to be happy because there's a lot in here you are not going to play board games again <laughs> <laughs> it's super deep and i would say that the problem isn't analysis paralysis it's remembering the rules because there's so much stuff going on there's so many actions you can t- take and like you're looking at this uh, power meter with three circles and they keep rotating and you're like you have to use them in certain points and then they regenerate in different ways and then every person has their own powers it can be a lot to take in i definitely struggle with it i forget all the time what i was focusing on and i'm easily distracted and despite the fact that i love a long strategic like i like to sit down to have a like a strategic kind of worker placement style game, I I do find I lose track of what I'm doing. And if I can remember all the way through the game what I'm doing, then I tend to do a lot better and make a lot more points. <laughs> yeah, I think we whenever we play Gaia Project, we have to do a rules refresh. Yeah. yeah. I but, think the shortest like rules video we found on it was like 45 minutes long. So <laughs> like, deep, deep. Yeah, I think if you had a regular gaming group that only wanted to play one board game, it would be Gaia Project, I think, because there's enough depth in here to last you forever, really. The problem is our group, obviously, we change games almost every session and our, our choices are, are, are different. But from a strategic point of view, I, I think it's fantastic. But yeah, it's a big one. It's a beast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree. It is, it is a great game with so many different options. Like you're not, like I think that the last time we played, I took one route and that everyone else was ignoring and I was so sure I was winning and then I lost by a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. Yeah. I now see why everyone might have been ignoring it. But it's one of those ones <laughs> that works really well in tandem with other things because I got to a point where, you know, I needed resources and I hadn't committed to getting mm-hmm. those resources. So if there'd been a better balancing strategy, it might have worked out better for me. But And there's like 10 different races they can pick from in Gaia Project. And we never straight from the three beginner ones or the four beginner ones <laughs> because we remember <laughs> yeah we want to learn more about the game rather than the yeah. sp- the factions but there's absolutely a ton of different choices you can make here and the different factions are tough some of the beginner factions like the minor ones they start off in, the, in a world really far away from everything else some of them are tough to play that's mine brian onto the top trees now into so what's your the, number three to the top three and number three i've put castles of burgundy this is a game that I love. It's it's one we always go back to. If you haven't seen it, it's it's like the the hexagonal board where you're building, you know, you're building farms, you're building castles, you're building towns, you're building rivers, boats, that kind of thing. It offers a lot of strategy where you're going, you know, okay, I'm going to focus on farms. There's a lot of points here if I can, you know, put all my pigs and cows into separate fields and gather up the points there. Or you can go, you know, you can focus on building the buildings and using the rewards you get from them to advance yourself. Like you can, you can take three or four turns in one turn if you're strategic enough about it. 
sometimes you have to get a bit lucky with, you know, what ones come up, but, you know, maybe you're going, okay, well, I need to, I need to finish this farm to get points. I could get cows, but they're not worth a lot to me because I've got a lot of pigs. So then you're trying to hold out for pigs and you don't want someone else to grab them from you. So it combines strategy with a little bit of push your luck and you have to kind of time everything right. Sometimes you just have to kind of abandon a plan and come back to it later or hope it works out. It, it, it's easily accessible for for players who haven't played a lot of strategy games, but it allows you to kind of, instead of just buying random whatever's available, you have to kind of go, okay, well, I don't have access to build all of that stuff, so I'm going to have to work up to that. So to get over there, I need to build a load of boats. And the boats as well will help dictate who goes first in the round. So sometimes it helps to prioritize building your waterways. They give you more access to your board and they give you the first player advantage. But it doesn't necessarily help because you've wasted four or five turns building boats and your teammates now have a load of castles up they have resources coming in they have extra bonuses from towns they've completed things so now you're kind of playing catch up so it might stand you in the long run but it might not pay off well enough so you have to kind of balance all of your simple enough strategies but it's a fun accessible game and like the others it it does suffer a little bit from analysis paralysis but more so When all the tiles are out, you're like, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm 100% sure. He took my tile. He (laughs) took my tile. I needed that tile. That was the one thing I needed. What the hell am I going to do now? (laughs) That's where analysis paralysis comes into this game. (laughs) Have your plans discovered. I I absolutely love Castles of Burgundy because there's very few games that allow you to kind of imagine what your board is going to look like and then try and see that through. Yeah. And so you can kind of see, all right, I know what I'm going to build. I'm going to build this, this, this. I'm going to get a whole bunch of points. And then you're trying to kind of materialize that into reality and it can be tricky because plans change and you know you, you're gonna go with pigs but now cows are just crazy cows are crazy right now i need to get on this cow train <laughs> and i absolutely love that feeling but yeah i think you still have that strategy in mind because of different types of cards different types of tiles so yeah it's, it's fantastic yeah and i think it, it's great that it's a good two-player game which is surprising because obviously i think you can go to four players in it that usually means that it's no good for two players. But I, I think that uh, myself and Brian play it quite a lot. The variety of player mats that they have in it adds to it too, but it just makes for a real interesting game. There's always enough variance from the different tiles that come out that you do actually have to modify your strategy. You can't just do the same thing. The different houses that come out or different marketplaces and everything mean that different actions are available or not available each game. And uh, that just makes it really, really fun. Yeah, and the, the randomness of the tiles and the rolling of the dice means that you, you do have analysis paralysis, but it's severely limited because you the choice you can make and what you want to get out of it. You're, you, you have to limit yourself, but you can still take, take advantage of things that come up that might help you and change your strategy. So yeah, it has that kind of elements of it that I absolutely love. Kira, what is your top three? So... Everdell is what I have chosen for my top three. So that is a strategy game where you're building a an animal-based town. And the cutest game going. The cutest, <laughs> absolutely cutest game on, on, I think, any of the lists. The little tokens Even are Blood little Ridge? <laughs> <laughs> And there's a, a giant tree in the game, which is mostly just to add tree-related themes. And the player board is not square. It is kind of curvy with kind of a river going through it. It's really cute. I think it's a very accessible game. It's definitely because you're building various different combinations of a little town. I like the strategy, the combination of cards. So it really draws on combinations of decks or of cards in the deck. And there is a lot of luck in that you're hoping that the deck is going to bring out the cards that you want. But there's also a lot of changing strategy as you draw new cards or as new cards come out in the center of the game that brings in and out different things. Maybe you have to discard cards to get what you want. It allows you to change your strategy as the game goes on. But also, it's not that long a game. We did, when we were playing it, have a lot of analysis paralysis from certain people. And I forgot it was my turn. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> that is entirely not true. That was not the only reason there was a lot of analysis paralysis. But yeah, I don't know what you do to change that. I don't know. Play with different people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that for the most part, there is, isn't an enormous amount that you can do. Other than trying to pick resources and pick what you're aiming for. 
and try. It is quite limited on player interaction. It's more your own strategy based on the on the the pieces that you you can see, um, and trying to get pieces before other, or cards before other people, or resources before other people. But I think that as the game goes on, that actually you don't really compete as much for resources because. As the seasons change, you pick up your workers and you start to go out of sync with everyone else. Though the last round where the creatures stay on the board can be annoying because whoever gets their first really gets their pick for that last round. But they're very cute little tokens. And I think it kind of has that, you know, that worker placement teams that run through things like Stone Age and Lords of Waterdeep. And you're guided by the cards you get in your hand as to what type of town you're going to build up. So you're really manipulated by the deck, but that also means that there's a varying strategy based on whatever cards that you get. So you do get that kind of, it's not the same game each time. That's my choice. Yeah, I really like Everdell. I think, like you mentioned, Lords of Waterdeep. I love Lords of Waterdeep too, but I would play this over Lords of Waterdeep if it came up again. I think it's more interesting. There's also the better kind of long-term strategy there's a different strategies you can do. There's lots because it's a worker placement, but there's loads of places you can put your worker. Lots of different choices you can make. And, you know, on a four player, it works. On a three player, it works. Two player works. I don't know what it looks. It's about an hour long. I think it's a, it's a fantastic game. Yeah, lots of depth to it. I think it might go quicker. I probably would, yeah. yeah like, I mean, the more we play it. Yeah. As you kind of get more used to the game and used to what cards combo well together and stuff like that, I think, you know, it would lend itself to strategy. Is it better to, you know, build buildings that'll get you critters or is it uh, better to, you know, just focus on critters and berries and stuff like that to to get them out on the board because they're worth points, they do more things, you know. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting, fun strategy game. Yeah, I think, and, and there's lots of depth to it. There's a whole bunch of cards. They all kind of work off each other. You can play it lots and lots of times before getting bored. Large Water Deep has some continuous cards too, and some like you know cards that attack other people. But I think Everdell has it's it's probably more balanced. I would say. Okay, so Owen, what is your top three? <laughs> My number three is Under Falling Skies, which is a game I got during COVID. I know we're still kind of in it right now, but uh, it's a single player only game. And so when, when there's no board game nights, we play this. And uh, it's like a Space Invader style game with kind of like a Independence Day style to it. These kind of alien spaceships are slowly coming down the board and you're trying to just blow them out of the sky. And you're also trying to dig underground with a little digger and build more like tech factories and robots and stuff like that. And it sounds pretty complicated, but it's a really simple game, really kind of easy to play. And it's challenging, incredibly challenging, because there's different levels, different difficulties you can play it on, but you need to be thinking about it a lot. And there's no time limit or anything, so you can just like play around and then sit back and say, okay, there's like 20 things here to do, and I need to figure it out. So it's the analysis paralysis is everywhere in this game. It's huge. <laughs> but because it's a single player game, you're, you're only not, holding yourself. You're not blocking <laughs> anybody else up. So it doesn't matter. So obviously the designers thought like this game has a lot of analysis paralysis, make it a single player. It's perfect. I absolutely I absolutely loved it. It was incredible to play. And it's also really small. It's a really small box to buy it in. And if you finish it or you've played enough of it, because there's a little campaign style module to it, then you can just hand it on to someone else and then they can play it. <laughs> a really great concept. And I, I'm glad it came out in a time where I wasn't able to see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, you're number two. Number two. I'm going to kind of throw a curveball into this one here as well, because I'm going to go for Pandemic Legacy. Any season. It's just the, the type of Pandemic Legacy games. Everyone knows Pandemic, where you're trying to fight down the virus and, you know, stop outbreaks and stuff like that. The Legacy games add an element to it of additional strategy that I really love because now you you play the short game, you're trying to stop the outbreaks, you're trying to stop things getting too out of hand, but you also have missions and objectives and like maybe you don't have to complete them all, maybe you have to complete some of them, but you know that whatever you don't do is affecting your long-term game. So you not only have to strategize in the short term to keep the virus under control, you have to strategize medium term to finish the game or to finish even just the month or the round, but you also have to strategize long-term going, well, look, if I don't complete this, maybe my research lab is going to get destroyed and that's going to make it harder to cure the virus in the next round. So you have to think strategy and balance it across, you know, 
the current game, the next game, the year long game. And I, like, I absolutely love that element too. It doesn't excessively change from the, like the, the way the game is played. It doesn't excessively change from the base pandemic game, but you know, you get extra features, you get extra additions to it and you know, where you're going, oh, well, you know, we'll just complete the bare minimum. The next month you've realized crap, completing the bare minimum has really hamstrung us for this month because now we have three extra things to do instead of the one extra thing that we ignored last month. So now you're you're scrambling to play catch up and you're having to prioritize and you're having to go, okay, well, look, you know, we're going to have to let a few outbreaks happen just so we can get on top of the long-term strategy of the game. I, I really like it because it, it forces you to, to think not just for the current game but it forces you to think for the next time you're going to play it so you're not just playing one game you're playing all the games and yeah yeah you really can't we all love pandemic legacy i think there's no doubt in that uh, it's actually incredible game and instead and usually in pandemic the strategy is kind of like you know action selection and it's just win at all costs and the the next goal is important but the legacy aspects of it makes you predict how you're going to win or if you're going to win but you know you can win in different ways and you need to figure out the best way to win to prevent your next go from being ruined so it's, it's a different type of strategy that you don't see a lot in board games really cool yeah and then pandemic obviously not a whole lot of analysis paralysis maybe a little bit too much randomness maybe there is there is a lot to it all right where you know you don't know where the viruses are going to outbreak and you know you're ready to cure it and you have everything set up and you know all the dominoes are ready to tip top over if you could just get one more blue card <laughs> but it's just not coming up because of the way the deck is shuffled so yes there is a there is a bit of randomness to it but it's like playing against a computer you know the computer has to be able to think for itself a little bit and that's where the kind of deck randomness adds to it so you you can't just go this is my strategy start to finish you have to go this is my strategy uh oh that's now becoming a problem. I have to divert to include that a little bit because now the game is playing back. So I like that. I like that a lot. Like in pandemic, it's so cool when you know an outbreak happens and it's centered around Europe or something like that. You know, for the rest of the game, we need to focus on Europe. And then sometimes, obviously, the it'll spread to different places. New cards will come out, but it's always usually the same cities that hit over and over again. Really cool. Yeah, and I think one thing about the Pandemic Legacy games that makes it different from campaign games is that in campaign games, you might get a few extra things for your character or with that whole, you might have to choose to lose a game to win the next game or to to finish out this. I think that that kind of critical decision making is one of the things that really differentiates the campaign from the Legacy game is like the do you actually have to just sacrifice a lot right now? Because usually in campaigns, you're getting like money or you're getting something to level up your characters or you're really worrying about smaller things. Whereas the whole, I might have to just, I might have to destroy something this time and never get it back just so that I'll actually finish. <laughs> you <laughs> know, know, Kobayashi Maru of board games. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you don't know what the full effect of that is yeah. later on. Yeah, next time might be like, oh, well, you've chosen this city to be the center of your hub for the, you know, the resistance. And then you're like, but this city is nowhere near any of the outbreaks. And <laughs> I made that choice because I had to sacrifice something in a previous thing to cause that to come into play. And it makes for a very interesting game. Yeah. Um, Kira, what is your number two? So my number two is another deck builder, Dominion. And I I guess like a lot of stuff I said about Clank applies in that uh, it is about the strategy is in having a deck that works, a deck that will work almost every time. You, there's, I guess for Dominion though, your points are flat cards, so they, they, they can't be used. You actually are forced into different stages of strategy in Dominion. So you can't get too many points early in the game because that makes your deck not work. So you have kind of a building up phase of your, and I guess it's kind of like a town management because there's, you know, there's buildings and like marketplaces and things like that that you're building into your deck. And you need to think about like, in the beginning, you need to think about 
getting more resources, making sure you have something that gives you more resources. And then in the mid game, it's about refining that deck, making sure that you have enough high powered resources because you're not going to get as many cards each time. And then the end game is filling up those slots with points. So I like that even though like nothing changes throughout the game, you have your 10 piles of cards that you choose and then your money cards and your point cards. And like it's, it seems so simple because it's so static in that way. And yet, because of what those cards, the implications of those cards, you're actually forced into quite a, a strategic game with different phases that like you don't even necessarily feel aware of. But if you don't play it right, if you fill your, if you buy all the points cards early on in the game, you get a deck that's useless because you've filled up with like one point cards that can, are, can do no good to you. And like, do you burn them? But like you're burning victory points and in some in some versions of the game, you don't get a, a you don't necessarily have a card that will allow you to burn them. So you're stuck with those one point cards that you've invested in in the, in the beginning of the game. And I just find that that like balance uh, keeps me intrigued each time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that you can play with, you know, everyone has access to the same 10 decks and everyone starts with the same 10 cards. And yet you can have such completely different games just because, you know, maybe you focused on gaining a lot of gold to get you points at the end of the game whereas I've gone for you know a few early points to get me off to a good start but as you said it clogs up my deck so it's very interesting to the way the different strategies come into play in in where everyone's playing off the same hymn sheet yeah I, I love Dominion especially with the variety of cards so many different expansions and even just in base game you can choose different cards to have on the tableau and they're all balanced. And I've never seen a Dominion card that isn't balanced in some point. And if you don't like a card, get rid of it. And the choices that people have to make as they play Dominion, they're obvious. I think people get it. And it gives you a long-term strategic look. The only thing, obviously, as a player is you never know how long a game will take. You know, the play times around 30 minutes. But are you, are you playing with a Brian who is just going to try and finish the game as quickly as possible? <laughs> Whatever the end game objective is just get there or you're going to play with someone who just wants to get lots and lots of points and you've got time and if you don't have a an engine that gives you that points as early as possible it can really hamstring you because i always i always find that i've i have built my perfect engine but i haven't utilized it to get the points in time but really fun game really fun game and you just keep playing it as well over and over again my number two is a game called hive which is a an incredibly small game. Uh, <laughs> it's like you just hive pocket, which I have all the time. Uh, you play it and it's kind of like you're putting down these six sided tiles and it's almost like chess where each tile has a specific ability. So there's a spider, there's a grasshopper, there's an ant and you have to place them and they do certain things at certain times. And the idea is you have to surround the other person's queen to win. The player to totally surround his opponent's queen wins the game. Yeah. And so the objective is you have to surround the opponent's queen. But the, my favorite part about Hive is that it's incredibly balanced because both teams have the same tiles. But when you're learning to play Hive, you're not really sure why some of the things work a certain way. So like when the grasshoppers jump over something, you're like, well, what kind of strategic benefit could this be? But then as you play a game and you realize what strategy worked and you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. These things go around. Strategies start to build up in your mind. And it's kind of like chess in the fact that like there's so many layers to it. So many like double bluffs and like strategies of like, I'm just going to move this pawn here, but that's not really what I'm doing. I'm thinking about four steps ahead. I need to get my bishop in a certain spot. Uh, it's a it's a lot like that in Hive. And I absolutely love that. I love the concept of that in a new game that someone doesn't know about because then you're learning together on it. And that means it just back and forth. And there's like, but yeah, in Hive, you can be very good at Hive. You put a person who's played Hive before against someone who's brand new to it, it's like chess. They're not going to win. There's no randomness. (laughs) (laughs) It is a very enjoyable game. And as you said, such a small little complex game for such a simple looking game it's it's very very enjoyable i have yet to win but (laughs) (laughs) it's a a two-player game yeah 20 minutes around 20 minutes 30 minutes takes to play and those that's just like a really hardcore 20 minutes so it's two players you got to be good at hive or you got to be playing with people who have never played hive before those are your (laughs) options (laughs) if you want to win at hive play against people who are bad at hive (laughs) I, I like the strategy. I like I like something so pure because it is like chess. It's kind of just a, everyone has the same options available to them. It's how well you play those options. And it's cute. 
like having those little bees and those little spiders and things uh, is nice. And there's a good bit of variety because it's the pieces that you can you have available that you can play with. Definitely very interesting. All right, drum roll, please. We're gonna go on to number one. Brian, what is your number one? I'm not good at drums. (laughs) (laughs) My numero uno is Ticket to Ride. I love this game. This is one of my go-tos when you're playing games with new people as well. I find it very accessible. It it has a great little strategy to it where, you know, you obviously anyone who's played Ticket to Ride, you're just trying to build train routes from one area to another. Maybe someone's blocked you off and you have to now take a detour and it's delaying you or forcing you off in a different direction. But, you know, maybe you're playing the slow game where, you know, you're not going for the quick, easy routes to to block people off. You're playing for the longer routes and you're getting more points and you're slower racking up the points, but you're racking up big points and you end up with long routes as well. You know, you can also play the, you know, I'm just going to build from A to B as fast as I can in the shortest little route possible. You're blocking off a load of people in the process as well. You're really inconvenient other players but it's a game where you can have the strategy of I'm going to play long term I'm going to sit back I'm going to wait I'm going to build up the cars I'm going to wait till I have enough to you know build a few good train lines so that people can't cut me off when you're playing with more players you know you have extra options that you can kind of build side by side and stuff like that as well but it's great to be able to kind of play the little strategic block or to be able to play the longer train and get more points and ultimately people don't know what you're doing because you have your task cards face down so you might be winning you might not be winning so you're you're playing for yourself but you're also trying to anticipate what people are doing so it adds an element of like thinking and you're watching the other players going oh like i want to get involved i want to try and stop them but I can't or like i don't know if i'm only helping them or if i'm if they're not going to do anything and that's just wasted trains for me so like I love it because it's a simple game to pick up, but the strategy is easy enough, but it's there long term and you have to, you you are going to have to adapt as more and more trains come out, as more and more areas fill up and, you know, do you balance the getting extra routes where you're, you're going, okay, well, if I can complete these, this is going to be amazing. But if I don't, they're going to shoot me in the foot first. (laughs) That's why I really love Ticket to Ride, that it's, it's an easy, accessible strategy game, but that there is some good strategy to it, despite its simplicity. Yeah, I, I love Ticket to Ride. The, you get a lot of satisfaction when you build a big train route and you get to put down your little trains, little plastic pieces all along and you build this big track and you get a whole bunch of points for it that you can't tell anybody about until later. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really cool. And, you know, there's options for people who are struggling. You know, they can have like this wildcard trains and stuff. And you can get lucky in it, but you always have this overarching idea picking up the objective cards you can pick up more if you want to but it kind of tells you you know what you need to do and then when looking at other people playing you're like okay this i should be worried about this part of my train track this is the one that's going to be the hardest to get through the land if that's a route i want to take and yeah so it's it's, there is competition in there there is a struggle and uh, i like that yeah And I think my main strategic choice is, am I going to try and build it all in one line or am I just going to go for loads of little lines? I like that each time that's one of the key things that I think about. And that provides me with a long term strategy and keeps my brain entertained for a little while. But yeah, you can you can hinder people and you have to think of if I build a track uh, between two places in the middle of nowhere, Will people think that that's part of a longer line and are they going to try and block me? Or will I just be getting that track early? So yeah, there's there's, there's a good amount of strategy to it. Yeah, and there's, it's about uh, two to five players, about 40 minutes, something like that. 45 yeah. minutes, so really yeah, good. Can we like, play in, in less if, if, if... Oh, I was thinking longer. Like, yeah, the, there's lots of different variations yeah. to the ride as well. There's shorter ones, there's longer ones. Pretty much everywhere in the world has taken yeah. the ride now. A lot of fun and it's not a complicated game. You can play it without thinking about the strategy. See, it's a good one for introducing to new players. Yeah, but you will lose to people who played it before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you won't <laughs> so feel like the it's a horrible in. loss. It's yeah. only a minor loss. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's really satisfying to play even if you don't know if you're winning or not. And you don't, you don't mind, I think. You get the satisfaction of completing a route. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the mini satisfaction of that. Okay, cool. So, Kira, what is your number one? Mine is Santorini. So, I love this game. I definitely think this game gets a lot of chances to get on the table. 
and um, even to get on the digital table on Board Game Arena because it is a very fun game. It's very simple as in you have to place it, you have to build and move and there is no complications in that piece. So it is just strategic, unlike it, uh, the basic, it's the first person to build and get on top of these cute little Santorini towers. And I like that. I like the simplicity of it. And then they bring in the gods, which allow each person to have a, a different starting power. And then you need to figure out how you're going to take that nice, simple strategy and win with the help of the god power. Because I'd say the one thing about Santorini is it's very simple strategy when you don't have the god powers. So, you know, there's kind of a try and get a corner for yourself. Try and block off people. Don't be too far away from them so that you can't cap their towers if they're getting too close. You know, there's kind of some very straightforward strategic elements that you have to keep in mind. And then there's like with the god powers, there's this extra layer of keeping you on your toes. So you still have to, you know, don't let them block themselves off so that they can just build a tower, but also try and block them off so that they're stuck in a corner and they can't win. And combine that with trying to build a nice tower. Um, I absolutely love uh, Santorini. It's such a great game. And the strategic elements are perfect in it because you start the game and you know everyone's god power. So then everyone starts coming up with plans. So your each god power interacts differently. So you can already f- sense strategies from players. And and then after that, obviously, it's just a blank slate. And it's incre- there's no randomness at all after that point. And it's just playing the game. And it's it, it's great. Yeah. I, I really like Santorini. Santorini always feels to me like a, a chess style game almost because, you know, you're you're trying to move into the best position to either trap your players or to ensure your victory or something like that. But then there's the wild, you know, there's the queen who comes in swinging, who's just devastating if she gets into your back line. But then, you know, you've got the god powers that mean you can just teleport to the other side of the board or you can just throw down tops of houses on the ground and... <laughs> And because the god powers add such a crazy strategy to it, you know, you have to balance one to the other to try and, you know, win, but also stop other players that you can't just ignore the other players that you have to stay involved with them. As you said, it's one of my favorite games. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Very little randomness, a little bit of analysis paralysis in the fact that it's tough to predict what's going to happen. And so your brain can kind of go a little bit too hard. But it's like chess in that, that matter. You're trying to predict what other people are trying to do rather than, you know, have your own kind of uh, choices. So like, you know, there's strategy in trying to figure out how you're going to build that tower to get to the top. And the team is so nice as well. Those Greek yeah, gods, it's so a really cute. nice team. And the components where it's on this kind of floating piece of land and then you're building these you're building like physical 3D houses yeah. as well. Yeah. And they look like the houses in Santorini. And yeah. it, it's really nice. And I think you have that sort of element of you're waiting for somebody to make a mistake or you're waiting to find a chink in the armor. It's when you've been playing in a long time, you get really like a basic, you know, system won't get you the win. The more you play with people, the more it's like, oh, I need to, I need to defend. I need to stay close. I need to, I can't be too far away. I can't be too near. And you really have to like, it's the, it's the, oh, I move back instead of moving forward in one get- go. Well, that's given him the edge to get in there or that's given me the edge to win because he, he stepped away from me. Just that space too, too much, which is surprising on a five by five board because you're never really that far from people. And yes, you can, it can feel like miles when they're, when they're close to winning. Yeah, because it's the force movement, right? You can once a few towers are built, you can force people to make their moves certain places, and once that happens, you can either make them go further away or closer, and then they have to build, and then it gets it gets kind of crazy, really entertaining and really strategic. It always feels like you deserve it, or you know, if you're playing three or four player games, it can be like a little bit of king making slightly in the fact that you can screw one person over and then the other person can go happily on his way to winning that's but most of the time it's a very strategic and the winner is the best yeah so own what is your number one numero uno number numero uno numero is, uno <laughs> <laughs> number o, it's a new language spanglish <laughs> my number one is splendor i absolutely love splendor it's a very strategic game the team of it is you are collecting gems 
kind of fancy gems and you are trying to use those gems to kind of build up more mines and stuff like that for more gems. And the team is actually kind of abstract. <laughs> um, yeah. I just realized that after describing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you have patrons who, if you get a certain amount of mines, they will come and, and give you extra points. So it's whoever has the most amount of points wins. There's At the very start of the game, there's a whole bunch of cards that are kind of sh- displayed. And that gives you a general kind of idea as to what gems are the highest value. And so if you see a lot of white on the board, maybe uh, white is going to be costing a lot more. If you don't see any reds, then maybe red isn't isn't too big. And then the patrons tell you what kind of cards to pick up later on. And it's a short game as well. It's, it, it doesn't take that long to play, uh, about 30 minutes to play. And there isn't any, a whole lot of randomness other than the cards. And so the top layer of cards, it'll take you a while to get there. You're kind of, you're kind of just picking and choosing your gems along with everyone else in a kind of competition to try and figure out what gems you want and then playing them. Very simple, very straightforward. And I love the components, very tactile pieces. Yeah, I, I, think, the, I think the players are what add the random to Splendor because you can be saving up for a, you know, one of the tiles and someone will buy it out from under you or you'll be going, I need to get two red ones next time and there won't be enough red ones left for you to take two. So it, it forces you to to change up your strategy and maybe go, okay, well, you know, I'll try to get it next time and I'll focus on this for now or I'll buy something that'll give me the extra red gem. I, I do love it. Splendor is this, a really, really fun game. I've lost count of how many times we've played it. It's it's brilliant. Yeah, because uh, it's tricky to get it's kind of short games like that to have the long term strategy feeling where your actions at the start of the game are going to lead your, you to victory at the end. And I think Splendor kind of gives that to you because you know if there is a lot of like patrons that want reds and whites, and and a player goes for blues, they're going to be on their own. And they, they're going to, because like no one else is gonna, really going to go for blues too heavy, but because they're on their own, they can they have more freedom to kind of build faster. But, you know, without the the numbers for the end game, they're kind of hoping that other good cards are going to come up and help them out. Or the, that the third line is going to be their key. So if they're not going for patrons, the third line is like the, the alternative high yeah. points area. Where the cards are giving you all the points. Yeah. yeah and that it's doable. It's perfectly doable to win with that, but you just have to invest differently. You have to make sure that your strategy is different enough from everyone else's, that you're not fighting over like the blue gems. You're just reaping in those blue gems so that you can move your way up all by yourself. It's really interesting. Yeah, a lot of risk and reward and choosing different gems to figure out what what it is. I, I absolutely love it. And yeah, it is quite an abstract team. The picture on the box is just of a guy holding some gems. It's it's unusual, but I think we always it's always an enjoyable game. You are against people in, and there is a bit of player interaction in that your strategy needs to not rely on any one card. By the time your next go comes around, that card might not be on the table. So you need to make sure your strategy is flexible enough that it can account for whatever comes up, as well as being strong enough to survive. Yeah, the, the bits and pieces, but also you're still aiming for something, so you can't be too flexible. You're aiming for the same thing as everyone else. Yeah, after, after you play Splendor a few times, you start to like look at your own gems you have and looking at the other players' gems and seeing what they would pick as cards and then starting to realize that like, oh, that person's going to go for my card. I need to figure it out. And so you can kind of predict what's going to happen as it goes along. And there's lots of double bluffs and triple bluffs and stuff. But yeah, it, it can be a little bit too random in the fact that the first row is getting bought over quite a lot. A lot of cards, a lot of playthrough of that, whereas the, the middle row and the top row of cards, they don't get bought too much. So you do have that long-term strategy, but the early-term strategy to get you those you know, blues and, re- and reds, it's a bit random. It's a bit, you're just hoping that you have the right gems to get the cards you want. So very tricky. I think that pretty much wraps it up for our top 15 strategic games. If you enjoyed it, share it. We've been decking out some games. Thank you for listening. See ya. Cheers. Bye. Bye.